Perhaps no aspect of the mind is more familiar yet more confusing than consciousness. The experience of self and the world is something we live with at every moment, yet there remains a mystery that has troubled cultures and thinkers throughout history. The pursuit of understanding consciousness is never ending, with new theories constantly coming to light. Today, the simple definition of consciousness is the state of being aware of and responsive to one's surroundings, or the fact of awareness by the mind of itself and the world. However, as we will discover, consciousness is far deeper than these initial definitions suggest. Exploring this concept could transform your view of reality. Though complex, once understood, it can be eye-opening. To be honest, the length of this video won't be enough to completely understand consciousness. Rather, the main goal is to provide a solid introduction to the topic so that if you're interested, you can explore further on your own. From historical philosophical perspectives, Buddhism, and even the idea that consciousness might be an illusion, this phenomenon is one of immense intrigue. So, what exactly is consciousness and what is so interesting about it? Before answering that, it's essential to first explore how our understanding of consciousness has evolved throughout history. Questions about the nature of conscious awareness have likely existed as long as humanity itself. Early evidence of spiritual reflection on consciousness can be found in Neolithic boreal practices and the beliefs of pre-literate cultures. These practices suggest that even in ancient times, people were wondering about the nature of the mind and self-awareness. Throughout history, consciousness was mentioned occasionally in various cultural and philosophical contexts. But it wasn't until the early modern era, around the 17th century, that it became a central topic in discussions about the mind. One of the crucial figures in the shift was René Descartes, who defined thought as reflexive consciousness or self-awareness. In his Principles of Philosophy in 1640, he wrote, By the word thought, I understand all that of which were conscious as operating in us. Through Descartes' ideas, a foundation for much of the modern understanding of consciousness was laid. Later, in 1688, John Locke offered a similar view in his work An Essay on Human Understanding. He stated, I do not say there is no soul in man because he is not sensible of it in his sleep, but I do say he cannot think at any time, waking or sleeping, without being sensible of it. Our being sensible of it is not necessary to anything but our thoughts, and to them it is, and to them it will always be necessary. Locke regarded consciousness as essential not only to thought but also to personal identity. This view of consciousness persisted for the next two centuries. By the mid-19th century, consciousness remained closely linked with the study of the mind. However, the relationship between consciousness and the brain was still poorly understood. Thomas Henry Huxley in 1866 said, How it is that anything so remarkable as the state of consciousness comes about as a result of irritating nervous tissue is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the jinn when Aladdin rubbed his lamp. In the early 20th century, the study of consciousness in the United States decreased, largely due to the rise of behaviorism, a psychological approach that focused strictly on observable behaviors, putting aside the study of internal experiences like consciousness. For decades, the focus remained on how the mind processes information, such as memory and perception, rather than on consciousness itself. It wasn't until the 1980s that interest in research in consciousness experienced a significant revival. This revival led to a deeper exploration of consciousness, laying the steps for modern interpretations and theories. This brings us to the next section, the philosophical perspectives on consciousness. Today, there are many different theories about the true nature of consciousness. Some of these theories even challenge the reality of what we see and experience. Before we delve into the religious theories along with the arguments against scientific perspectives on consciousness, it's important to first consider the philosophical ideas that have influenced our understanding. Idealism is a viewpoint that asserts reality is fundamentally mental or spiritual. In other words, without our minds, reality as we know it wouldn't exist. According to idealism, the external world is a product of our mind, and consciousness is the core substance of reality. Here, perception shapes reality, suggesting that what we consider physical objects might actually be illusions. In this view, everything that exists does so within the boundaries of consciousness. Consciousness isn't just a part of reality, it is reality itself, making the mind the fundamental building block of all that we know. Opposing idealism, we have realism, which argues that an external world exists independently of our consciousness or perceptions. Realism posits that the objects we perceive in the world exist whether or not they're being perceived. This view suggests that consciousness is simply a means of accessing and interacting with the reality that exists outside our minds. Here, reality shapes perception, not the other way around. But aside from the significant debate between idealism and realism, we encounter two key metaphysical perspectives. 
Dualism is one of the most well-known views on consciousness, famously proposed by René Descartes. Dualism suggests that consciousness and the physical world are two fundamentally different substances. Descartes argued that the mind and body are distinct entities that interact with each other. According to dualism, the mind cannot be fully explained by physical processes alone, because it possesses non-physical properties. This perspective implies that consciousness exists independently of the physical body and might even continue after physical death. On the opposite side of this debate is physicalism, which holds that everything that exists is either physical or can be explained by physical processes. When it comes to consciousness, physicalism asserts that conscious experiences are entirely the result of physical interactions within the brain. Under this view, thoughts, emotions, and consciousness itself can all be reduced to neural activity and chemical processes in the brain. In addition to these major philosophical debates, there are other perspectives that remain influential today. Pampsychism suggests that consciousness is a fundamental aspect of the universe, existing in all objects, not just in humans and animals. According to panpsychism, even the smallest particles of matter have a form of consciousness. This view is often seen as the middle ground between dualism and physicalism, presenting a universal presence of consciousness while still acknowledging a physical reality. Now that we've explored some key philosophical perspectives on consciousness, let's examine how Buddhism views the soul, body, and consciousness itself. When it comes to understanding consciousness, it's impossible to ignore the insights offered by Buddhism. In Eastern philosophy, Buddhism has influenced views on consciousness for thousands of years. In Buddhism, Vihana or consciousness is one of the five aggregates, also known as khandhas, that make up an individual. These khandhas include form, sensation, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. Consciousness in this context refers to the awareness or experience that arises in response to something. For example, when we see the sky and perceive its blue color, the awareness of that blue is the function of consciousness, the fifth skanda. However, recognizing the color as blue is in the action of consciousness itself, but rather the role of perception, which is the third skanda. One of Buddhism's central and more challenging teachings is anatta, meaning non-self or no soul. While many believe that a soul inhibits our bodies throughout life and perhaps continues even after death, Buddhism teaches that there is no permanent, unchanging soul or self within a person. Instead, what we think of as the self is just a collection of temporary and interdependent processes. This challenges the common belief in a permanent soul, suggesting instead that the self is impermanent and constantly changing. But why haven't we explored scientific theories of consciousness yet? Well, one major issue stands in the way. The hard problem. One of the most debated topics in the study of consciousness is what philosophers call the hard problem of consciousness. This term was introduced by philosopher David Chalmers in the 1990s. The hard problem revolves around the fundamental question, why and how the physical processes in the brain give rise to subjective experiences. In other words, why is there something it feels like to experience the world, to see colors, hear sounds, or feel emotions? Why do conscious mental states light up and directly appear to the subject? This contrasts with what Chalmers calls the easy problems of consciousness, which include explaining how the brain processes information, reacts to stimuli, or how memory and learning occur. While these topics are complex, they can be addressed using scientific methods that focus on the brain's structure and functions. However, even if we were to fully understand how our brains operate, the heart problem would still persist. Why do these physical processes create an inner, subjective experience? The hard question is so difficult to answer because it deals with the nature of subjective experiences, also known as qualia, which doesn't seem to fit within the framework of physical science. Simply put, consciousness isn't just about function or structure, it's about the experience itself, an experience that science struggles to explain. As Chalmers points out, what makes the hard problem hard and almost unique is that it goes beyond problems about the performance of functions. Even with a complete understanding of the brain's operations, we would still be left wondering, why does all this activity give rise to conscious experience? This problem creates what is known as an explanatory gap, a gap between the physical processes of the brain and the subjective experience of consciousness. This gap suggests that consciousness might be a fundamental aspect of reality that cannot be fully explained by physical processes alone. Which is why the hard problem suggests that finding a scientific theory to fully explain consciousness is challenging. However, there is one major theory that we've yet to discuss, one that might be even more intriguing than anything we've explored so far. One of the most intriguing and controversial ideas about consciousness is the theory that it might actually be an illusion. This perspective comes from philosopher Daniel Dennett, who developed the multiple drafts model of consciousness. According to Dennett, what we think of as a single unified experience of consciousness is actually an ongoing process that our brains are constantly building. 
For a moment, imagine your brain as a storyteller, always writing and rewriting multiple drafts of your experiences. These drafts are created in different parts of the brain, each offering a possible interpretation of what's happening around you. As these drafts compete for your attention, the most relevant or meaningful one becomes the version that you're aware of at any given moment. For example, if you hear a strange sound and see something move out of the corner of your eye, your brain quickly creates several possible explanations. The interpretation that fits best with the context, perhaps that the movement was caused by a cat knocking something over, becomes the experience you consciously recognize. More interestingly, Dennett's theory suggests that there isn't a single true version of reality that we access through consciousness. Instead, what we perceive as reality is just the most convincing draft our brain has settled on. This leads to the idea that consciousness is an illusion, not in the sense that it doesn't exist, but in the sense that what we believe to be a direct experience of reality might actually be misleading. In this view, our conscious experience can be seen as a kind of best guess, rather than an exact representation of what's really happening. However, Dennis's theory has faced a lot of criticism, especially from those who argue that it doesn't fully account for the depth of our conscious experience known as qualia. These are the personal subjective experiences that are hard to explain just by looking at physical processes alone. Because of these complexities, this theory hasn't been confirmed as true, and it's important to consider that it doesn't account for all the context, information, or other theories about consciousness. Ultimately, there are countless theories about consciousness, and that's exactly why it remains such a mystery. From philosophical perspectives to religious views, and even the idea that consciousness might be an illusion, this concept goes far beyond the simple definitions you might find with a quick search. Yes, consciousness can be described as being aware of yourself, an object, or the world around you, but it's much more complex than that. How do we truly know if what we see is real? Can we be certain that the external world exists independently of our minds, or could it all be a mental construction? Are our soul and consciousness temporary, or are they eternal? These are questions that may never be fully answered. If you enjoyed this video, subscribing would be greatly appreciated. As always, thank you for watching.